Hey, hi Tony, how are you doing? I'm fine. How are you, Samir? You in these a, challenging yeah. times. Oh yeah, uh, everything is is great. Everything is great. I hope the family are well. The family is uh, great. Uh, thank God uh, everyone is fine. And uh, we hope that this will be a good momentum for Morocco to make uh, what I call a leapfrog so that we can really use the, all what we've learned during this uh, event and uh, we can share it with uh, all our youth and we can, they can take advantage of it and prepare themselves for the 21st century. So now we're going to be talking about something quite important. Uh, everyone knows that the English language is the, today the global language. Uh, it is not a language about, it, it is not a, about America or the United Kingdom. It is about the world. If we want a Moroccan to communicate with a Chinese and a German and a Brazilian and uh, an Arab uh, from the uh, Saudi Arabia, the main language that's going to be shared by all these people is English. And I know that you're the head of the British Council. You're helping a lot on this endeavor for Morocco. I would like you to share with us, uh, first of all, yourself. You know, you'd like to introduce yourself and share with us all the efforts that you're making. And we're going to open the floor for Q&A from the audience so that they can tell us what they think about Morocco going English. Well, thanks very much, Samir, and welcome everyone who's joined this uh, Saturday afternoon discussion. Um, my name's Tony Riley. I'm the country director with the British Council in Morocco. Um, relatively new, this is my ninth month in Morocco, um, but I'm quite a seasoned British Council country director, having worked in many countries in many parts of the world and often involved in large English and education programs. Um, before Morocco, I worked in West Africa, East Africa, Sri Lanka, Iraq, uh, South Africa, um, and, and Oman and Kuwait as well. Um, so I'm, I'm, you know, I've, uh, a long sentence with the British Council and no time off for good behaviour, but it's been a fascinating career and one where English education has been, you know, central to most of my roles. And, and I really look forward to participating in, in this important discussion around the place of English in Morocco. Uh, a country with a really rich linguistic tapestry, uh, a country blessed with multilingualism. Uh, some would say that that's both a huge opportunity and an asset, but does come with some caveats and some problems as well. Um, so I look forward to participating in this discussion um, around the role of English as a global language in the future of Morocco and its uh, ambitions and its um, international outlook. Um, uh, for all the uh, participants, please, uh, you can ask the questions in the Q&A tab. So please, if you have any questions, uh, you can ask the questions in the Q&A tab. So I'm gonna start with the first question was, do you think that English, we got it from the audience, uh, uh, do you think that English would take the place of French and Spanish on the linguist level in the kingdom? Okay, really, really interesting question. And, it, and, and the question of language in Morocco is often framed in this way. Should English replace French? Should French replace Arabic, modern standard Arabic? Um, my own views are that... Morocco's multilingualism is a huge asset. If you include English with French, Arabic, and Spanish, 
Many Moroccans speak four of the six most widely spoken and learned languages in the world. Four of the six are spoken in Morocco. And I think that that has huge advantages for the country in terms of its international outlook, its aspirations to be a gateway to Africa, um, to be an international hub for commerce and industry uh, and innovation. However, within that linguistic makeup, French, Arabic, um, Spanish, and of course the Berber languages, um, English is probably um, playing catch up. Uh, I think that there has been a, a degree of neglect of English, but since my time here, I've noticed a real um, demand, particularly amongst young people, for English. The Ministry of Education are absolutely clear that they wish to improve English learning outcomes. However, just to answer the question, I don't think this needs to be a zero-sum game. It shouldn't be French or English, it should be French and English. And I've said this on a number of occasions uh, because I think that um, I wish my citizens in the United Kingdom had the linguistic abilities uh, that people in Morocco have because it's a huge asset. It's an asset in terms of the 21st century and how interconnected we are as nations. It's also an asset cognitively to be able to speak two or three or in many cases four languages. So it shouldn't be French or English. In my view, it should be French and English. Uh, Tony, when we, when we say French or English, what I mean by that is the science, the technology, the mathematics, uh, the, uh, all the things that will make us uh, advance in terms of our projects in Morocco and our technical aspects of being in, on par with the rest of the world. And unfortunately, we cannot teach math in English and French. We have to choose one language. And if we want to teach technology, we have to choose one language. If we want to teach physics, we need to choose one language. If we need to teach medicine, we need to choose one language. If we need to teach finance or accounting, we need to choose one language. So as a Moroccan, I can tell you that we need to teach all what I mentioned, uh, like technology and math and science and what we call the STEAMs, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, medicine, all these in English. Because if we don't, we, are, we can't find the resources. Today, 80% of the content on the internet is in English. And all the other languages are less than 20%, including Chinese. So if we really want to open our mind and op open our, our uh, world, we must adopt English heavily in the science technology. I have no problem learning French and Arabic. We need that as a language to speak with, to communicate. But when it comes to technology, when it comes to doing our finance, when it comes to relations with the world, when it comes to giving the chance to those youth to be employable in the future, they need to have the English language. And learning today or education is not only something that you finish at a certain level of your age. It is, an, it is a lifelong uh, endeavor. And everybody needs to have that autonomy and self-learning so that they can start learn by themselves at home and what a better way than to master the language of English and to learn by yourself without having even to go to some of these uh, centers. So if you can agree yeah, or disagree on that, because I know that you're the head of the British Council and maybe you need to be politically correct, but I don't. I'm a Moroccan and I can tell you this is what we need. Um, I don't have to be politically correct. Um, <laughs> I, I 
genuinely believe in multilingualism. Um, but many of the things you've said are absolutely spot on about English as a global language. You know, if I can add to some of the facts that you've just trotted out, Samir, you know, it's a language that's spoken at, at, at a useful level by about 1.8 billion people worldwide. You know, we've done some research in the British Council and very soon there will be a global population of English speakers or learners of 2 billion. It's the universal language of the internet, as you said. It's the language of international organizations. 85% of international- I cannot hear you. Uh, operate. Hear you. Sorry, you can't hear me. Can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's cut enough, yeah. Uh, so go ahead, go ahead, continue. Yeah. I was just adding some of the facts around English as a global language. You know, 85% of international organizations um, operate in English. English is the official language of many countries in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. 70% of employers in non-English speaking countries in key industries require English. Um, you're right, it's the language of employability. It's the language of academia and research and science. I agree with all of that. But I think what's important, Samir, is that we make a distinction during this discussion between English, learning English and improving the teaching and learning of English as a subject and English medium instruction, teaching science subjects in English. And while the aspiration may be um, to teach science STEM subjects in English, there are some important preconditions before you make a switch from teaching those subjects in a language that the teacher is competent in and the learners are competent in. Um, many countries have made the mistake of um, in the the recognition of the importance of English, um, they have moved too quickly to introducing English uh, in primary school, but also at the tertiary level in universities, they make a switch to English, have science subjects, engineering taught in English by lecturers whose English is not particularly good to learners whose English may not be that good and may even actually in some cases if it's not good be better than the lecturers so i think we need when we're talking about english and its future we need to to talk about how do we improve the teaching and learning of english as a subject and at what point should we consider teaching other subjects in the medium of english Um, well, uh, you spoke about like making the jump. Uh, other countries have made the jump from English from French to English, and uh, one of the one of the well-known countries now is Rwanda. I visited that country and I've seen what they have done with the education, and I've seen how an African country that was torn by a civil war, how they were able to really move that country in the right direction. It's a green country. I remember just before stepping out of the airplane, they told us, do not take with you any plastic bags, you know, which is totally forbidden. And they're very, very strict on that. Uh, it is a country that's introduced technology in education and they're actually assembling their own computers and spreading the computers by hundreds of thousands in education from primary onward. So it seems like English and, and technology are coming hand in hand. And here's a country like Rwanda that's making a leapfrog. And very soon you're gonna hear about it as real emerging country. We're already uh, seeing so many effects of their decisions that they took a few years ago. Yeah, no, I mean, Rwanda is a really interesting example. Um, 
I mean, choices around sort of language in education policy are often torn and uh, between um, politics and ideology and pragmatism. Many of the things you've said, Samir, are pragmatic acceptance of the importance of English as a global language and the need to equip Morocco's next generation with English. But how it actually plays out in many countries around the world, including in Morocco, is that there's a, there's, there are political considerations alongside and sometimes competing with those pragmatic considerations. I know Rwanda quite well. I was uh, director of the British Council's operations in East Africa. And in fact, we um, managed, uh, we still do manage a very large program to support the Rwandan government's shift from French to English, which has not been easy, continues not to be that straightforward, even for a country, a small country, 11 million people. Um, we're managing a, a Department for International Development funded program called Building Learning Foundations, where we're training almost all Rwandan English teachers um, in, the, in the entire country to try and equip them with the right English levels and pedagogy to be able to effectively um, improve English learning outcomes. However, the reason for Rwanda making the shift was not pragmatism, actually, it was more politics. Um, you know, emerging from, you know, a devastating genocide, as we all know, in Rwanda, um, the country wanted to build a new identity. They wanted to make a complete shift from the past and the ethnic divisions. And the decision they made was politically motivated, but with a tinge of pragmatism around the importance of building a nation that could um, compete, as you say, in terms of innovation and their other aspirations to become a, a conference capital um, in English. So yes, you're right, they made the shift, they are making the shift, they haven't made the shift. And actually my team in Rwanda, um, you know, are supporting the government, but it takes years to train enough English teachers to improve their own English first, but very importantly, also to improve their pedagogic skills. Where it hasn't worked as, as well, Samir, uh, if you go further south in Africa to, to South Africa, where I worked back in the post-apartheid era, when South Africa adopted 11, 10, 10 official, maybe it was 11 official languages, one of which was English, um, there was, um, there was some real problems with per parents pushing schools to teach English before the English teachers were trained, before the materials um, were available. Um, and this had a negative effect on the overall educational outcomes in the South African education system, uh, because it was a premature push for English without putting in place the structures and the resources required to make that shift? Well, I mean, uh, obviously, uh, making the shift, uh, it's important that you start with education. Uh, to start with education, you definitely need to prepare the people who are in the education field, which means the teachers and the administration and everyone to make such a move. And such a move needs to be a smooth move. But now, as we see, uh, uh, happening, the the world is moving too fast towards English, and I feel that Morocco is not getting its fair share of the pie that we can get ourselves in terms of commerce and in terms of international relations, because we're still stuck in the French language, and our decision makers are still stuck in the French language, and the only way they communicate. I've been into in meetings with, uh, with uh, 
ministers in Morocco were, you know, when I was in Microsoft with our vice presidents, and the only language they could speak is French. I, I don't understand how can you, you know, be a minister, I'm not saying all of them, I think we have few who speak uh, fluent in English, but I think all of them must speak English. All of them must have the, those, those communication skills to be able to conduct our international affairs. And imagine if we had all the Moroccans now who are well educated in English. Look at all our, for example, our call centers. They're limited to the French, most of them are limited to the French countries that they can do work with uh, or do e-commerce. So uh, Moikin the move makes a lot of sense, commercially speaking, financially speaking, tourism, tourism. I mean, look how our tourism, I mean, we can do a lot more in tourism if we can be English speakers, okay? Uh, Education-wise, it will just open up the world to our students. They will find all the resources that they need online, most of them free of charge that they can learn from. Uh, fortunately, our youth are adapting much faster than our, our teachers. So they're actually learning. I've met students that have perfect English, a very good accent. And I'm like, okay, did you live in the US or did you live in the UK? Depends on the accent. They said, no, no, I learned everything on YouTube. I live on YouTube. They, they live on YouTube. So, so this, this opening, we just need to accelerate it. No, I agree. And we, we need to make it also, it shouldn't be only demand driven, but it should be also push driven. I, I, I thank you for what you've done by making the British Council courses available on Moroccan TV. That's very, very generous gesture from your side. And I hope that we start, you know, that's the start of a movement. So many things happen positively during this confinement. And uh, we need to ride on the wave. Um, let me, I, we have some questions uh, that I would like to, uh, <laughs> this is an interesting question. Uh, do you think Monsef Slawi, Dr. Monsef Slawi, who was appointed yesterday by uh, the, uh, uh, the American government uh, to, become, uh, to, to become the head of the task force to find a vaccine and save not only America, but save the world if he wasn't an English speaker? Uh, imagine if he was only French speaker because he actually he studied between Morocco and Belgium. And I'm sure that's throughout the, his studies in Morocco and Belgium, it was predominantly French. But if it wasn't for his move to a multinational that opened up the world to him and English, I'm sure that he had to learn it because any research that he has done in vaccines, this is a person who actually developed so many vaccines before without such a know-how, I don't think he would be in the position where he is now. So we need to really, it's, it takes a courage to make such a step. And I am for having such a courage so we can find a disruptive way of, you know, I, I'm, I'm not saying we should not learn French. What I'm saying is if we're gonna learn math and science and technology and physics and chemistry and finance and marketing, let's learn it in English. Let's stop teaching it in French or any other language. No, I agree. Um, and, and, you know, I, I'm not being politically correct. I, I agree with everything that you've said. I mean, 95 of the top 100 universities in the world teach in English. Yeah, that's a fact. Um, in terms of, you know, 75 to 90 percent of academic journals are in English. There is no doubt. Um, what I think I'm saying, and I agree with your push to be disruptive um, around English. My concern, and it's a concern that the British Council have globally, because our role is to promote and support um, the teaching and learning of English. That's you know part of our DNA, DNA, sorry, as, as an international cultural relations organization. But we want to do it in a responsible way because there have been cases, Samir, where 
maybe in the push to disrupt and accelerate and embed English, actually the educational outcomes in some of those countries are poorer as a result. And a lot of that is to do with the role of mother tongue in establishing a firm foundation of literacy and numeracy before you begin to add on second and third languages. So I think what I'm saying is I support everything you're saying, um, particularly given Morocco's commitment to have a strong national and international outlook amongst its future generation. Um, to have that international outlook, it must include English as a global language. Yep. To become the gateway to Africa, it's not just about finding markets in Francophone Africa. You know, on your doorstep, you know, you have massive English speaking markets, Nigeria, Ghana, Kenya, South Africa. Um, so I agree, absolutely. I just think it needs to be managed in a careful way and not in an irresponsible way. Well, um, I mean, we got some, uh, I have some questions. We have 22 questions here that I would like to roll. And if you can just give us some, uh, there, are, there may be some questions I'll be able to answer, uh, others that I will pass on to you. So question is, how can you help Moroccan private schools to adopt English as a language of instruction? Um, I can answer that. Today, Morocco, uh, already has a, 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 a international baccalaureate with the English option, the same way they have it with the French option. So I recommend that the private schools choose that option. And there is a whole curriculum on science and technology and math. Everything is already set. And even the exams are already set by the, uh, by the Moroccan government and the Minister of Education. In fact, there is also public schools that are already adopting. I know that Lise Moulay Abdullah in Casablanca has the option of uh, Moroccan high school, international high school option English. So, uh, so I hope that answers the question. Um, one of the question, is it possible for a country to be developed one with a language other than its language? This is a very good question from uh, Imad Nsia. Well, we talked about Rwanda. Let's have a look at Singapore, you know, in adopting English. Um, no, it is, it is possible. It is possible. But again, it needs to be planned for appropriately. Um, teachers need to be trained uh, appropriately in terms of pedagogy, as well as their own, um, their own uh, competence in the language of instruction. Um, resources need to be made available and as you say um, as you know Samir um, there's a lot of digital disruption that's enabling the shift to English I mean there's so many English medium resources available now um, digitally that um, that's really helping to accelerate um, the demand for um, English medium education um, one of the questions is how supportive is the Moroccan government for introducing the English language in Morocco? Incredib incredibly supportive. I mean, I mean, it, but coming back to um, uh, Dr. Salaw Salaw um, Salawi, um, isn't, isn't that a great achievement for a Moroccan to be, you know, heading up the, um, the vaccine um, program in the United States um, and, you know, hopefully accelerating um, the, the development and the testing of a viable vaccine that the world can benefit from. But, you know, your own Minister of Education, um, who is also an immunologist, um, Dr. Saeed Anzazi, the government spokesperson, when I met him uh, first on my arrival in Morocco, he said to me, I have one priority, and that is English medium education. Um, I want to, within our national education system, improve English learning outcomes. The same is true of your guest on your last webinar, 
Dr. Driss Wawicha, who was the president at Ala Hawaiian University for many years. Um, so there is a clear recognition, but I think there's also a responsibility that they take quite seriously to do this in a managed, professional way. Um, and I think also, I think there is a prize here, and that is the prize of preserving Morocco's rich multilingualism, because that's a, a huge asset. You're right, they need to improve English. English, there's a gap, there's a lag, uh, there's a need for acceleration and disruption, but not at the expense of that that multilingual dimension that is also part of brand Morocco. Um, so the, do, do you think the amount of time and weight uh, allocated to English in public schools would help promote the learning of the language? Um, as, as an owner of a school, um, I, think, I, I think it's not enough. And the only way to make it enough if we start teaching math and science and technology in English in the, uh, in the schools, because we, it will complement the learning of the language, because there is learning the language and there is using the language as, as, a, as a communication medium. And uh, that will complement. If you have both, then definitely it will go much, much, much faster. Um, one of the questions here, yeah, what is the importance of English for university students? And I would, you know, it's quite important. You just mentioned how many journals around the world are already in English. And today, if you, if you do any research or any write-up on in any other language but English, uh, your chances are it, it will not be read. Uh, can you, uh, Tony, can you elaborate on that? The importance of English for the university students? Yeah, I mean, it's critical. And uh, Dr. Wawicha and I discussed this all the time. Um, earlier this year, we'd established a UK Morocco Higher Education Commission. These are key people in Morocco and key people in the UK who want to, to collaborate to improve the higher education system here. They've established a number of working groups that reflect the priorities. One of them is English. Yeah, so it's too, it's too bad you did not invite me. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, we, we, can, we, can, we can rectify that. But um, right. at higher education, clearly, um, English is, is, is critical. The two programs that we've made available during the, the lockdown, the emergency measures here, are targeting young adult learners. So, word on the street which is being broadcast twice a week now um, on the former sports channel, Ariadia, um, is, is, is a program for young adults. So particularly appropriate for university students. And Obla Air, which is going out on Atlantic Radio twice a week, um, again is a, a program to improve English for young adults we recognize that there is a massive demand. Um, I mean, I think, you know, the, the, the key thing in making this switch, uh, Samir, and I know I keep repeating this, is that you have to improve the teaching of English as a subject before you can um, move into teaching subjects through English, English medium instruction, because you really need a critical mass of uh, university professors who are competent in English before you can make that shift. So there's a planning issue there as well. But um, it does I, get accelerated. I, I, when I was in, in Microsoft, um, we partnered with the Minister of Education to uh, train 300,000 teachers on technology. And uh, the, it was really widely embraced, uh, not only learning about technology, but even getting certified as, uh, as, uh, as educational certifications for, for technology in the class. And it's not only for the 
technology teachers, but it's for uh, any type of teacher. It can be Arabic or French or physics or chemistry, any subject. So I think what we need in Morocco is uh, pedagogical classes and how to, how to make a, a teacher uh, of math, of science, of physics, of chemistry, take all his know-how, whether it's Arabic or French, and be able to teach it in English. As we know, in, I mean, math is pretty much a lot of symbols and, and science and technology and chemistry. So I remember when I went to the US to study, it wasn't, it took me like, I would say, a couple of weeks for me to adjust all my French know-how in math to an English know-how. You know, as soon as I learned what that symbol meant, or actually what's how it's pronounced, it was very easy for me to, to follow through and, and to learn fast. So is there an effort on training teachers of math and science and technology and medicine and finance and accounting and marketing to teach what they know in French to teach it in English? Can I, I, you, 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 you accused me rightly um, of being a little bit conservative or politically correct. Let me, let me, um, let me remove my, my, um, my, my protection just for a moment, because- <laughs> That's what we want. <laughs> there's a really important point here, and that is that in teaching the French language, it's not just the language, there's a pedagogy associated with French medium education. And I'm afraid it's quite a traditional pedagogy. It prioritizes rote learning. Um, you know, I've spoken to international children who've found themselves at a French school and they've said, I'm not even allowed to ask questions. Yeah. Um, English and, and English pedagogy embraces the notion of 21st century skills. The idea that education needs to nurture critical thinking, problem solving, communication and collaboration um, alongside, of course, high order. Uh, ent entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship. So the French didactic approach in its traditional sense is not fit for purpose in the 21st century. And I think young people recognize this people recognize that by learning English they're also embracing a different pedagogy and a different preparation for the 21st century. So you know 30,000 Moroccans choose to study in France each year at higher education. Um, they don't yet choose to study in English medium universities whether in the UK or elsewhere well, uh, do, you, do you know why? Because I mean, of the, what, 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 I mean, mainly because of the costs. There's a cost issue. And, and, and there is also the relations that France, uh, you know, embraces a lot of Moroccans to come and study in France. I, I am sure that once uh, the United Kingdom and the United States do that, then it will become much easier. I, I can tell you as myself who studied in the U.S., I started my bachelor's degree and I had to pay for it, but both my master's and my PhD were, pay, were paid for by the uh, university. Yeah. I had 100% scholarship, didn't pay one dime to study. And on top of that, I was at certain time teaching assistant and then research assistant. And I was paid as a research assistant in, in the 90s, I was paid $1,400 a month, which was enough for me to live in the United States and to study without, you know, having to do any other thing. So a lot of people don't know about these things. I would love to see more Moroccans. I know that even the UK gives scholarships. I have a program which is a foundation year for UK universities and they do give scholarships. You know, it, it ranges anywhere between 15% to 50%. So when, when I look at that, Pretty much the cost of studying in France is equal to studying in the UK, but people don't know about it. I think you yeah. need to also uh, uh, spread the good news that you can study in the UK or in the US 
today, even in China, China, I, I received two universities who visited me from China and they're offering 17 degrees in English, 100% in Shanghai for $2,000 a year. And the cost of living is $200 a month. So this is actually cheaper than studying in Morocco, in English, in China. So uh, I think there's quite an opportunity for Morocco to open up I to agree. the world. So uh, we have to do it. We need to make the jump. I know that we need to be careful, but I think the cost of waiting is much higher than the, 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 the cost of, of not waiting. There's an opportunity cost. I mean, half a million, half a million students from countries around the world study in the UK each year. It's a very international student body. The other thing you've got to remember, um, um, Samia, is that wages for English speakers around the world in, uh, you know, are on average about 34% higher. So there may be some short-term pain in terms of the costs of being an international student in the UK, although there are half a million international students in the UK from countries all over the world, but the earnings of English speakers afterwards are much, much higher. Um, I mean, this is a question about the British Council. Is this, isn't the job of the British Council to promote the UK and not just the language? Do you, do you just think this homogenization by itself? Absolutely. English so is... Says, I, I, I also have to be politically correct. English, English is, is only one of the um, uh, areas that the British Council works in. Um, and in fact, word on the street, the television program is not just actually about English language, it's English language and, and culture. Um, so, you know, the British Council, um, actually its purpose is to build trust and understanding between the UK and more than 100 countries where we operate. But we do that through English, through education collaboration, and through arts and culture programs. If you have a look at our website at the moment, during the COVID-19 lockdown, we've been putting a lot of digital arts and culture content onto our website. And it's remarkable, actually, the, the shift in the arts and culture world um, around digital art. So you can go onto our website now and you can watch the finest theater in the world um, from the UK. You can visit our art galleries and museums virtually and enjoy the latest exhibitions. Um, there, there really is an awful lot of um, uh, arts and culture material because you know that is very much part of our mission uh, as the UK's international cultural relations organization. So you, the, the, the questioner is absolutely correct. It's not just about promoting the English language. And as I've said, even when we do promote the English language, we try to do it responsibly. Yeah. Um, I, I, I meet a lot of young people and it is mm. really interesting when I see someone who speaks English. Uh, I see in this person much more um, competencies than just the English part. I see this person is proactive. I see a person who's willing to adapt. I see a person who's an entrepreneur in his mind. I see a person who's, uh, uh, you know, not afraid of the unknown. And those skills is, it, it's quite interesting to make it, make our education system, uh, you know, put that in the DNA of the education, because these are the competencies that we need for the 21st century. Don't you agree, uh, Mr. Tom? Absolutely. I mean, our, our program Connecting Classrooms, which we deliver here in Morocco and around the world, is all about um, embedding 21st century skills, getting teachers of all subjects to embrace the notion of nurturing, problem solving, critical thinking, communication, collaboration. And those are the skills that you that you recognize in, 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 in English speaking young people, um, Samir, because 
that's the pedagogy that goes alongside English medium education. So students at your school in the London Academy are not only developing their English skills, they're developing their what they call core skills, the 21st century skills, as well as, and one of those 21st century skills is of course, um, digital literacy. One of, your, one of the people on this webinar just said something really important, which I completely agree. English is not the UK's language anymore. English has become a global language and, and, and is richer for it. Um, so, I mean, we don't claim the language as our own. It's a language that is spoken, you know, around the world. Um, I have a question here. Uh, last week I had a very nice webinar with uh, Dr. Rashid Yazami, uh, who's uh, the inventor of the lithium battery, uh, very well known scientist around the world. And we had a discussion about uh, like the China is the future and you know, it's a, it's a worldwide uh, uh, force now, economy, etc. It's like, so Morocco, we should not make a second mistake. Um, um, my answer to that, if China today, uh, China, we, I mean, I, in, in my school, I teach Chinese as well. So this is, uh, for me, it's a language that Moroccans should learn because it will open new opportunities for them. But in China, uh, if you go to the university level, uh, most of the science and technology and medicine, all these things is being taught in English. So, um, you know, there must be, we need to distinguish between the two things. Learning the language, the Chinese language, I think is quite beneficial for Moroccans. And we should make it as, you know, the same way we're looking at English now, we should look at Chinese. Because now English is looked at as, as a third optional language. I think English should become a must language and Chinese should be looked at as that third optional language. Because if we can get, you know, even 20% of Moroccans to speak Chinese, can you imagine what it will do to our economy? Our relationship with China uh, as a gateway to Africa, as a gateway to, uh, to, uh, to Europe, as a gateway to the world, uh, I think we can do quite, quite a lot. So Absolutely. I think uh, no. There's, no, there's no exclusivity on any, on any aspects. Tony, no. you want to say something about that? No, I was just going to say that, that my own organization, the British Council in the UK, have been very strong advocates of uh, young people in the UK learning foreign languages. Um, I mean, I wish we had the abilities of, of, of Moroccan in terms of uh, multilingualism. And we also, you know, we manage the Erasmus scheme in the UK, the British Council, which is encouraging young people to get uh, an international outlook, to spend time in another country. We also manage a scheme of Mandarin Chinese scholarships where we are encouraging um, uh, young people from the UK to study uh, Mandarin Chinese um, and take advantage of these scholarships. So you're absolutely right. Um, there's no exclusivity. We need to recognize, and if COVID-19 has taught us anything, it's how globally connected we are as nations. Um, and we need to embrace that and one way of embracing that is to develop the the ability in languages to be a, a player uh, on the global stage and English is critical um, um, in, 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 in that respect. Um, the question is we can never be innovative uh, no, we can never be, no, we can never innovate in someone else's language. Um, I don't think innovation is tied to any language. I think language is a medium. And uh, for me to have access to technology and innovation, because I don't want to, um, you know, uh, start from scratch or reinvent the wheel, I cannot today just uh, say, well, I'm going to, teach it or I'm going to learn it in a language that is so far from the mainstream where science and technology is. 
at certain time of the world, the Arabic language was the lingua franca of the world. And uh, people from Europe uh, had to learn Arabic to learn technology and astronomy and architecture and so and, and medicine. I, I, I've read that Avicenna, his, his, uh, his medicine book was taught in the UK up till maybe a couple of centuries ago. So I'm sure that they have uh, learned it in Arabic and maybe translated to English. But, you know, we have to, we have to be pragmatic. I'm not saying that we're going to lose our language. Our language is our mother tongue. We should actually teach it correctly because actually I feel that we are losing even our language. We are losing the uh, uh, Arabic and we're losing the Amazir language. We have developed quite a mix of many languages and we don't speak correctly any language. Let's be frank. You've just frozen. Samir, I'm not sure if you can hear me. You can still hear me, Eunice. Thank you for letting me know that. I think Samir is going to dial back in. Are you back with us, Samir? Uh, I, I'm in. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Go ahead. I can. Um, yeah, no, I mean, you know, you're right about um, the way that languages change through the years. Um, I mean, I, 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 let, let, me, let me repeat what I said at the beginning, because I'm not sure whether everybody picked it up, but, but in Morocco, people speak four of the six most widely spoken languages. What a, what a huge asset that is. Um, you know, there are English two billion speakers or users of English, um, the English language. Spanish next. 540 million people speak Spanish. French, 300 million. And Arabic, 274 million. It's still a, a huge um, uh, population of people who speak Arabic. Um, the point you were making, though, is really, really critical. And my organization are, are, are real kind of advocates of um, preserving languages and culture um, because languages can die. I mean, you're absolutely right, Samir. If you don't nurture mother tongue and indigenous languages, um, they can eventually um, uh, die and, and with them a, a whole culture which is so important to to preserve um, the other thing about mother tongue here is is the need to um, to take advantage of what we know from educational research is the best way to ha establish a firm foundation of literacy and numeracy and that is use of mother tongue it enables parents and families to participate in their children's education as well um, well, yeah, one of the questions we have is Morocco is now working on his new economical model. We're going to, uh, to more opening on other area from the world, like Eastern Africa and Asia. So do you think that we need a new vision about our educational system to be more adapted with the new vision? And as economic research, I believe that especially in the field, we need strangely to teach this economics and management in English. Do you agree with me? I absolutely agree with you and I'm going to pass it to Tony. No, I agree. I, we're all in agreement um, that um, the, the Morocco's vision, its roadmap, um, uh, its international outlook, that the dual dimension, strong Moroccan identity, knowing exactly and, and, and celebrating Moroccan culture, history, outlook, alongside an international dimension. 
um, is, is, is at the heart of the vision for education um, in Morocco. And education is the engine to achieve that international outlook. It's, there, there is no, no question about it. And, and English, I mean, young people know, young, as you say, you speak to young people, it's not just their thirst for popular culture, which of course is another um, area that's dominated by English, film, music, etc. But it's a recognition of, of the employability issues. It's a recognition that you cannot be part of this global world without, um, without English. Um, so I agree absolutely with your, that, 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 that last question. Um, yep. They're spot on. Yeah. Um, question is, don't you think that learning languages is triggered by economic incentives? This is why some languages are taking ground on the detriment of others, such as uh, such is the case of Chinese. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, part of the pragmatism is, is economic pragmatism. Um, there's, there's no question um, that uh, people want to learn Mandarin Chinese largely so that they can do business with this superpower. Yeah, well, I mean, it will open the, the world to us. Um, we got a lot of questions. We only have a couple of minutes left. Let me see if we did not answer. Um, this is a quick question is, uh, what am I looking for is to practice my English. So how can I do that with an environment that doesn't speak English? Um, can, can I, I mean, let me just say during, you know, the, the lockdown, um, we've had to rethink how we engage with our audiences and customers. And we've moved around the world, including here in Morocco, all of our own English classes to virtual lessons, Samir, as you have at the London Academy. So we're now teaching adults and young learners um, all with an innovative pedagogy that embraces 21st century skills um, virtually. The very interesting thing, and this is why COVID-19 will accelerate changes and embed them forever, we won't be going back, we'll be going forward, is that, that many of the learners, adults and young learners and their parents, um, actually are saying they prefer the virtual pedagogy and virtual lessons to the face-to-face. So I think that moving forward, um, we're not going to go back to 100% face-to-face. We're going to embrace a blended learning pedagogy moving forward. But the British Council's English classes, as well as all of our free um, online teaching and learning resources, um, are, you know, all, all moving online. Well, I, I, I think the blended learning formats will actually remove the frontiers from education. This will just remove the walls uh, behind us and in front of us. I don't need a visa to learn to get even a degree. And there's so many degrees um, uh, that you can learn and get online. So I think this is a paradigm shift for education. I hope it will continue beyond this uh, this uh, pandemic and I hope that this will be an opportunity for Moroccans to open their eyes to a new way of educating themselves with new tools and a new language. So uh, if you would like to give the last comments uh, before we wrap this uh, this uh, very nice well, webinar. Thank you very much. Sir. Go ahead. Well, no, I mean, thank you for the opportunity. I repeat what I say. Um, Morocco is remarkable in its multilingualism that needs to be preserved, but they need to catch up on the demand for English and for English medium education. We're here to help the government, public and private sector to achieve that. Watch this space on our website. We're about to launch a digital library, British Council Digital Library, which will give access to hundreds of thousands of ebooks, newspapers, magazines, um, music, film, theater, software training. Uh, the British Council have curated a digital library and we're going to make it available free to Moroccans. We'll launch it in the next couple of weeks. There'll be a, an app on your mobile phone. 
where you can register and have access to the British Council's digital library. Um, thanks for everything you're doing, Samir, in Morocco, of championing the becoming a champion, being a champion for the English medium education. Um, you know, it needs people like you to push it through to disrupt, but let's do it responsibly. Let's not do it at the expense um, of any impaired educational outcomes. Um, I mean, thank you very much, uh, Tony. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, we're pragmatic. We are an independent nation and we like to choose the best tools, the best languages that will help us succeed. I don't think we have room for uh, not being a player in the world arena. We have the best geographical location around the world. We are at the gateway to Mediterranean countries. We are at the gateway of Africa, at the gateway of Europe. And we have so many assets. We have a very young population that is resilient, that's adaptive. And I think we just need to arm them with the tools and the languages that will enable their success and give them the best chances of success. So thank you very much for being with me. And I look forward to another webinar. We, we can expand on some of the things that you spoke about. And I would like to thank you for your generosity to enable the Moroccans to learn English from their home. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure. And good luck, everybody. And Eid Mubarak when it comes next weekend, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you.